Everybody, welcome back. I'm sorry it took Monday off and it was, uh, I guess, an exciting day for some of you out there. Today was probably even more exciting given some of the economic data numbers that came out, which we'll talk about on today's show. But I'm going to dive right into it with our guest. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about uh, active futures trading. You know, we can go into all sorts of different topics on today's show, as I would encourage you guys to send in your questions. Uh, we had Jerry on the program many times, and today we're going to dive into the active futures trading side of things with Mr. Jerry Baldwin. Jerry, how you doing, my friend? I'm great. It's great to be here. I uh, appreciate the time and always enjoy coming to visit you. So uh, I'm doing great. The markets are moving and everything is awesome. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, a little. I, I'm a little frustrated today. I didn't. I did not get up early. Just kind of. I was in Austin, Texas, for a wedding, so I came back and I was a little tired. So I didn't do anything in the morning. And you know, when you look and, and you see that the S and P and the Nasdaq are up like four percent, you're like, oh man. I've got a bunch of long positions. I was actually thinking of holding for like the next couple of weeks. Really, I'm looking at maybe going into the second week of January to hold these positions. But boy, it, it's really hard to not dump it when it's up 4% in a very short period of time. But I still held it. So I'm keeping that. I'm, I'm good. Long would it answer your question? I'm pretty damn good. I, I love my positions that I'm in and I'm going to keep holding them. <laughs> You're the best. We're never at a loss for words. A simple fine would have done, but you know what? I'm, we're never at a loss for words, you and I. That's what makes this thing work, man. No, no, not at all. It's funny. I watch, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Yellowstone. And one thing I've learned about Yellowstone is they need to fill time. So they will take a, t a scene that should be literally 30 seconds, and it's it turns into a 35-minute episode for one scene. And maybe the show's turning into some of that where I'm, I'm embellishing a little bit on my answers to, to, to grow the shows to one hour, I guess. <laughs> You are amazing, and we're going to hit some high-level content, you know, whether they're ready or not. So you and I always do. We're going to have a great one, as always. Well, let's dive into it. I mean, we talk about active trading of the markets. That'll kind of be our topic du jour today. And um, if you look at, at what happened today, obviously, the CPI number came out much better than expected. For those who may not know, I will share that with you right here. Let me show you the screen. Here is your economic calendar for today. And you can see right, at the, right kind of in the mid-pack here, you had the previous CPI number was 0.4%. They expected it to drop to 0.3. No surprise there because of what we saw last week with the PPI numbers. We came in at 0.1% and the market's like, hallelujah, hallelujah, and just soared to the upside. I will show you the chart here so you guys can see that. Here is the daily of it, but let's break this into a, a five minute time frame, And you can see just huge move right as that announcement came out at 5.30 this morning, vaulted up. I mean, it, it was a, I'll, I'll tell you how much that move was. It was a... 3.2% move in five minutes. Um, that is pretty astronomical for any index to move 3% in in just five minutes. But that's what we had, and uh, unfortunately gave a lot of that back. But still, you know, I think the market is holding on to this hope that the Fed might backpedal a little bit on their rates going forward. But uh, you know, th that's that's how this day started off. But <clears throat> You know, how, how are you looking at, how are you potentially trading this thing as, you know, you're watching these markets soar and then kind of sell off a little bit? Yeah, you know, more, and it's funny you say that because, you know, as it normally does, we saw this move, the origin of this move actually start yesterday. And, and in my room yesterday, um, we identified uh, all three. We look at the, the Dow Nasdaq, S&P, the Russell as well. But we identified specifically the S&P. Um, I believe it was about a 10.05 candle. Uh, this is central time. And just uh, uh, that was the origin of the move. And it never went back after that. I, You know, I've got, as you know, I've got a couple of custom indicators that I've developed over the course of doing what I'm doing. And we we got an indicator on there. Um, you know what, here, if you don't mind, I'm going to share this. I'll actually, sure. the picture's worth more than anything. Yeah, right? so I'm, I'm actually drawing over here. So your charts would be better. But yeah, I was drawing along. Yeah. Yeah, let me uh, let me do a new share here. All and right. I will pull up. Uh, there we go. Let me go to this yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, let me go to this chart. Let me move the zoom out of the way for us. Um, I've got this thing all set to go on the uh, micro grid on CL from today. But let me let me move this over just in a moment here, and we'll go to the S and P. Oh, good, it's already up. So um, what I wanted, what I'm talking about is this move. Like I said, it actually started yesterday, and then followed through this morning right after the announcement like you're saying so i'm going to scroll back real quick here and you'll see this is a five minute chart and i still have the fibs lined up this is from like i said this is from yesterday morning um here it is all right let me identify exactly where i was putting this thing in here we go 10 o'clock in the morning yesterday um so these are these are a couple of the indicators as you know that i've i've designed um they, it's a combination of uh 
of two indicators, and it's it's to, what it does is it determines bullish and bearish trends um, as customized by me. I use specific numbers. It's it's all pretty much proprietary, but it's it's amazing the way it goes. So um, right here is if I, if I click on the data, if I click on the candle, you see the 1005 chart. That's yesterday morning. Again, this is Central Time. Um, if I fib this off, and as some of your viewers know, I've got my fibs custom done to do three to one for me, um, one to one, two to one, and three to one. So you can see once we broke above that yesterday at 10, now I'm going to make the chart smaller. Literally, that is the bottom. Look at that. So we achieved the two to one here yesterday. I was following this yesterday along as well. Here's a three to one. And then I don't have it on this chart, but there was an ATR number. Uh, in other words, a, a calculation that I teach in my course and in my room um, that uses the Globex, the overnight futures levels and the ATR levels to predict with a high degree of probability how high or low any specific product could go. And it literally filled out the ATR. It was about a 45-point move from this origin on the five-minute chart. So, and then like you said, I mean, look at this. This is, there it is. That's what you're talking about, yeah. which was, a, I think you said a 3% move on five minutes, which is insane, but it was in the direction of, you know, the origin that we identified in the room yesterday, but then also of the larger time frame trends, which is something else that I really try to blend into my own trading is, you know, as you do, you know, using the multiple time frame analysis and being able to, you know, be on the right side of the trend and, and being very diligent in terms of identifying, you know, whether these are, uh, you know, these trends are identified as bullish, bearish, or there's a mix. And when there's a mix, I usually try to stay away. But yeah, you're you're right on. It was it was an incredible move this morning. And then, um, yeah, unfortunately, depending on one's perspective. Uh, it did sell off here. You know, you can see the rest, like you said, the rest of the day. So, um, yeah, big move. But uh, I will say, you know, I started out the room. So speaking of long-winded answers, but. <laughs> That's right. You learned from the master of, uh, over here. <clears throat> I, I guess so. Huh? So, um, but it's funny, you know, blending the long-term analysis. And, and I know you love our radar screen, as do I. Um let me just get this out of the way for us here. This data window tends to stick around a little bit. So let me move this thing for us and then I'll go back to that radar screen. But it's funny. Um, so you use, you like TradeStation 9.5 as well. You're like me. You're a stubborn old curmudgeon that doesn't want to use 10. I know. Uh, I do prefer 9.5. That is very It's true. so yeah, buggy I, though. I, it, it has so many little bugs to it, but I still, like, I do a lot of my analysis on TradeStation 9.5 and I, I don't know why I don't go to 10, but I, I guess I'm just old school, I guess. Yeah, you know, you find, and, and that's what I tell my students, you know, because we have some using nine five, some using ten, but it's like whatever you like, whatever, whatever works for you, stay with it. You know, it's, I mean, that's just like trading. You know, I mean, I show a lot of cool stuff, you show a lot of cool stuff. Ultimately, the student has to take, you know, the best of what they're seeing and what you know fits and identifies with their trade style. And if yep. they do that, then you know they're they're doing it the right way. So, but there's so many right ways to do this. You just got to kind of, you know, make it's got to make sense to you. So, um. But yeah, it's funny. So we started the room this morning. Uh, again, I'm out here in Southern California with you this week, and that's uh, you're the first person I thought of. So, um, you know, I'm still doing the room, uh, even though I'm on the road here. And uh, so this morning we went through the equities and we had a lot of mixtures. This is my radar screen, as many of your viewers have seen before. You know, I've got the, the products on the left for anybody who might be new today. The products are on the left. I've got five futures products on here. We do trade the uh, the YM as well. We just I just don't have this one on here. But you know, I've got different intervals that I look at. Um, I've got stochastics and RSI on here. I've got DMI, which is direct directional market index. Um, so I've got a number of pieces on here, but you know, we start the room every day, and, and this is how I start my own trading. I look at the radar screen, and what I'm looking for is either you know all all one color or all another color. You know, I don't want to see this mix like we're seeing right here. And it was funny this morning we looked at it and and the radar screen was it was mixed. We had you know, the K line and the D line out of line as far as the stochastic indicator. We had RSIs not all in, you know, above a specific number or below a specific number, which signifies a tr an uptrend or a downtrend. And so we went past on all of those and went right to this one, okay, which was CL. Now it's changed a little bit from this morning, but we had all numbers in line here. We had all stochastic numbers in line here. And it made for a great trade. And, and I'm going to take you guys through that here in just a second, just kind of sharing with you, you know, my methodology and what I do. And like I said, everybody's different and there's a lot of right ways to do this. But it's amazing when you can hit some precision with regard to the, you know, your targets. And that's why I, I custom did this FIB tool so that it would do exactly that. And 
So here's, you know, I start my room at 10 o'clock in the morning, central time. So that's eight o'clock Pacific time, of course. And, you know, here's the indicator that I've been talking about. This is one of, you know, three indicators that I've, I've done now. And, um, you know, it's got the little blue dot on there. So it's showing you that, Hey, in this candle, we went to bullish numbers, you know, with regard to a couple of a blend of a couple of indicators that are incorporated in this, you know, in this indicator. And so, you know, the way I look at this is I'm going to look to be long above it, you know, put a stop down below. And then I simply mark off the high and the low of the candle with my fib tool. And it literally draws for me, you know, the 200%, which is one to one. So if you take the risk of this candle, you know, one to one of that, or, or you know, um, would be right here, two to one would be there. You know, many students are taught, you know, like we want the three to one risk reward. And it, it's just crazy when you start to get the hang of this thing. Look at the precision with which this thing hit. And anybody I want to welcome, by the way, you know, the view, all of everybody in my room. And I've got a, a, a really nice size room, but everyone from my room is here with you, Merlin. They love you. They love seeing the show. Um, welcome, I've been everybody. letting them know for over a week that, you know, I was going to be here. So they're here with us. And, um, you know, they see this every day. These are, these are in the rooms. I, I, I record the room so that people can actually, um, you know, watch them at their own convenience. But, um, so this was, this was my, this was my good one today. I mean, this was, you know, a high of 75, what is that? 75, 16, the three to one was up here. It's like a, what is that? A dollar, almost a dollar, ten dollar fifteen. Yeah. Crude oil was great so today. It's a thousand dollar move on one contract of the mini. So, um, and again, just went to this one, kind of moved on from the equities because the equities moved, but they never really identified a clear trend, whereas this one did. And it, it made for a, a beautiful move. Merlin. So a, a great day today. You know, go back to your, your grid there real quick with all the different levels. I want to kind of give my two cents on something. You know, one of the things yeah. <clears throat> that we look at so often in trading is you know, going with the trend and making sure you're in the right direction. And he's got uh, your grid level with all the, the, the there you go. That, that's the one. So. What I was going to point out here is if you notice, he's got this ES right at the top there. So he's got the one minute, five, 15, 30, and the 60 minute for all these different um, securities. And he's got uh, five or six different ones. Um, some people have asked me in the past, well, what does that mean and how does that work? Well, if you look back here on the S&P, and I'll share my screen with you guys so you guys can see this. If you look back to when the markets rolled over uh, on Sunday night, right, and opened up on Sunday night, I'll put on a 15 minute time frame and go to before the big pop this morning. I mean, you have an unbelievably beautiful uptrend. It was just higher highs, higher lows, pretty much ever since we, we opened up on Sunday night. And, you know, if you looked at what was happening at that time, stochastics, let's say this is, I'm on a 15 here. If I add on stochastics, it's going to show me right here on the hard left side that it was oversold. But very quickly, it's going to start to show positive territory and all of a sudden get to an overbought situation, which would be above 80, which means it's trending strong. And I'll show you how on all these different time frames, uh, it starts to look that way. So, <clears throat> nope, that's not uh, stochastics. That's ATR. Go to stochastics, which should be right here. There you go. So you notice that most of this move, barring a couple little pullbacks, it, sto uh, stochastics was overbought pretty much since Sunday night all the way through right before that announcement. And if we take a little bit bigger time frame here and go to an hourly, you can see that <clears throat> it was pretty. Much, it actually did not drop below from Monday morning all the way until right after it spiked today. So when you're looking at a list like he's got here of all these different time frames, you know, he said he likes to see them all the same color, all going in the same direction. Well, today you would have had the NQ, the ES, the Russell, uh, all showing positive, most likely over 80 for an extended period of time and really going all the way back into Sunday night. So, you know, just wanted to add a little bit of confirmation as to why you look at these different time frames and why you're looking at getting everything lined up. Now, you don't have to all be lined up, but the odds are better when they are. Absolutely, Merlin. And, and I love the way you worded it because it's, it's perfect. But, you know, and the, the way that I, I I present this to people or students specifically is, you know, you know, you, for example, you trade, you trade, you know, let's say, for example, you trade the five minute window, you know, maybe I trade the one minute window and I'm just using us as an example. You know, I, who's one of our viewers? We got a viewer out there. Who's one of your favorite viewers? I can't say that. It's like saying, who's your favorite kid? I love them all. They're all awesome. <laughs> Let's see. You know what? I'm going to use. Uh, Everybody you know, tell I me. I can't do that either. So we're. Yeah. We're tell us what your favorite Bob. time frame is. Everybody's got here. See, it's tough because, you know, most of the people that watch this, they know that you shouldn't rely only on one time frame, right? You should have multiple time frames to look at, and it's going to be hard for them to pick one time frame. So what do you want? Their execution time frame? Their. That's, that's, in that, yes. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm looking for is their execution time frame. Okay. So, you know, and again, just to follow through with the example, which really isn't going well at this point at all, I should have rehearsed this anyway. But anyway, you know, you're using, you're trading on a five for your execution timeframe. 
I'm doing a one, let's say, for example, you don't say Bob is out there and he's trading the 15, you know, Sally's out there doing the 30. You know, if, if we're all seeing the same thing on the same time frames, then the market is going to trend. You know, the tr if, if we're all reading these indicators and we're using them the way that they're intended to be used, now all of a sudden you see positivity on the five, I see it on the one, Bob, Sally, you know, everybody sees it on. So the market tends to trend in that direction. And it, it does, like you said, it adds tremendous probabilities, you know, to your trade. And but but on the same side, if you know you're tra you're trading the five, and all of a sudden you know you see some a, a mix of bullish and bearish, or maybe bearish. I'm seeing bullish on the one. You're going one way. I'm going the other. What that what that's going to do is cause sideways action in the market, and and we don't want that. You know we want to be on the right side of a trend, whether it be up or down, and unanimousness within the time frames will do that. Or what I call it is uh, what I, I use the word alignment. You know alignment in the time frames will help do that. And then it's just a matter of you know, identifying where the origin of the move is that you want to be in on. I've got an indicator that does it. You know, my students have the indicator. So it shows, okay, exactly where things crossed over, either bullish or bearish on a smaller time frame, in line and in alignment with the larger time frames. And all of a sudden now you see exactly what you just saw on the screen, uh, on my screen and your screen, but that oil trade that I showed from this morning where you're, you're talking about, a, you know, over a thousand dollar move on one contract of a mini because things were lined up the right way and, and the analysis was done. So, you know, it, it's really cool stuff, as you're saying, Merlin. Mm -hmm. uh, just one comment here for Believable Direction. He says uh, he's got the 15, the 5, and the 1. Uh, let me add my two cents to that one just because, uh, while I do use all – actually, I don't use the 1 anymore. I used to use the 1. I really don't use the 1 anymore just because it's too jiggy. You get too much action there, and uh, it's just a matter of personal preference. I take a lot fewer trades, and I get don't have an, as many losses when I uh, don't use the 1. So give me to a 5 is like my lower. But I'll start with the daily. I'll go the 4-hour, the 60, the 15, and the 5. Now <clears> – <throat> Execution wise, five minutes is my execution generally going to be on that five minute time frame. However, uh, believable, I would, I think you'll do better for yourself if you add in one big time frame because you got a 15 minute on there as your big time frame. That really is not, you're not seeing the big picture. And here's what I mean by that: if you look out here today, and here's the S and P futures on a 15 minute time frame. So that's your highest time frame that you're showing me there. I've got this yellow box, and, and if you didn't look at the bigger time frame, you wouldn't see this because I, I'm literally showing you all the data that can squeeze in a trading view screen here, and I don't have uh, – where is this level coming from? But if I go out to the daily here <clears throat> and zoom out a little bit, you can see that I'm using that level that's really the peak from this move back in September 12th, and then I might be able to craft my shorter-term strategy around that um, around that going forward. And to me, that, that's really important is just make sure, even though it may not be the piece that you're executing on, Make sure you have a, a view on the big picture there before you you execute on the small time frame. So anyway, just had to throw that out there. <laughs> yeah. No, Merlin, I love that. That that's well done, and I agree with you. I, I don't have it on this the radar screen because I I don't require it necessarily because for the active trading, but but having the because so I only go up to sixty on the radar screen. But as far as the like you said, the daily time frame, I, I always I always say this in the room. I say this in the room almost every day, but. When we are in line with the daily time frame, as you're saying, it does it does lend itself well to probabilities. You know, if, if you've got everything, you know, one through 60, you know, on your on your side and you can include the daily time frame as well, like you're saying, it, it's only going to increase probability. So I, I love that. And, and yeah, I agree with with the the, uh, the viewer that you're you're talking to. It's um yeah, I would go a little bit higher than just the 15. I, you'll you'll see. You know, you got decent probabilities there, but they will increase as you include a couple of the larger ones and the daily ones an excellent one to, to include. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I've asked this one before, but I, I want to just because I'm looking at your your screen right here. You've got five or six things. And what I love about it, if you go back to any chart, just so go back to any chart that you had where you got your indicator on there. And this is why I think indicators can be nice is it just it helps you <clears throat> read into the, the prevailing trend. But for Jerry's trading, he really sticks to five or six big instruments. You guys see he's got the NASDAQ, he's got the S&P, the Russell, gold, and crude oil. And my question that I've asked before, but I, I always love hearing it again, is if you just throw that indicator on any time frame, why can't you trade that one? Why can't I just throw this on rough lumber? Why can't I throw this on corn, wheat, or soybeans? Why can't I throw it on Apple or Tesla or Intel and, and get the same results? Because you really refined it. You only look at a few things, which I, I think is good, but maybe that warrants some explanation. No, it's, it's, it is a great question. And, and people will ask that from time to time. And, you know, any indicator is going to is going to run more fluently based on good volume. And so what I did here basically is I took high volume futures um, because this is where 
the indicator, any indicator will run the most smoothly on because of the highest volume. So, you know, Tesla, Apple, you know, uh, stock products like you're talking about, or even ETFs like the Qs or the SPY, it will work beautifully on that. Um, I just stay away from, you know, some of the commodities like wheat, corn, some of the other ones, lumber, because of the inconsistency in the volume. And I don't want, um, you know, there to be those large swings one way or another, just based on an increase in, you know, increase in volume based on an announcement or something. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the big reasons that I, I stated these six. Uh, and again, with the, the volume on specifically the, well, crude, of course, S&P and the NASDAQ. Um, the volume is so significant there that if if one of those isn't moving, odds are nothing's moving right. um, more often than not, just because these are, these do carry large amounts of volume to them and they'll run really smoothly um, with regard to indicators because of the volume attached to them. So uh, and then also simplicity, Merlin, I think I think I mean, that those are all facts that I, I yep. just laid out. But the reality is, for me, I think when I first started learning stock trading, you know, the the scanning process and the work behind scanning, trying to find qualified candidates and looking through 2000 stocks. And um, I just found it to be very cumbersome, to be honest with you. And and I, I like the, nothing is easy in this, but you do have, you know, once you learn it, it becomes a lot simpler. And this approach is very simple. You know, I mean, we spent, uh, I think I spent four minutes this morning opening up the room and going down these indicators, disqualifying the first three equity products because they weren't in line and saw crude, jumped on it and here at 1005 boom we're off to the races and i actually did a live demo on this one in the room this morning i i showed how you know to bracket out of positions or, or scale out of positions and it was uh it was very powerful so um and of course those like i said those recordings i do put up every day so that if people aren't able to be in the room with me live and either be a participant or see what we're doing in the room, they can come back after work and they can actually, you know, view that recording at their leisure and, and kind of see exactly what we did. So, but that's the answer to, to why I kind of stay with the products that yeah. I stay with Merlin. Yeah. And uh, there's a comment that came through from Pepe, which I think is a great comment to piggyback off that. He says, I do the same thing. I trade five instruments in the futures markets, specialist, not a generalist. And I think that what you pointed out there is for a lot of people there is too much work you get paralysis through analysis and um starting off with just something smaller or a smaller selection uh, can really increase your focus on those asset classes now generally if you are just going to pick a handful of them make sure that they meet specific criteria they've got to be liquid they have to have enough movement for you and understand how that instruments work so if you're trading you know s p futures well that's gonna be very different than trading spy there's obviously different mechanics so trade a few and then i think when you um really start to get better at trading, then you can expand out and go, you know what, maybe I will play with tests a little bit, just a little bit and see if what I've applied works for that one. And if I can start to see better results, then maybe I'll trade that more frequently. But, you know, realistically, I think most people uh, should focus on the indexes when they're starting out, you know, SPY if you're trading stocks or S&P futures or NASDAQ futures, but stay with the big ones that have uh, less single stock risk and lots of liquidity. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Volume and ATR. Those are the two big ones. Hey, Merlin, I've got something pretty cool. I've never shown you and I've never shown any of your viewers. And uh, I, I love I love your following. I love I love the people in your uh, that watch you every day. I, I've gotten to meet many of them over the years of, of doing this. And uh, so do you do you have a specific risk in mind per trade or do you use a specific candle to kind of determine risk and it's different on every trade or it's, what, it's, um, what do you have a formula for that? Cause I want to show you something that I came up with that I, I really love. For me, it varies. So it really depends on the security. It's based a lot off ATR. And of course, looking at the zone that I'm using to make the basis for the trade. So if I have a demand zone, then that's going to be a major factor in determining what my risk will be for that trade. And of course, you know, obviously we're looking for a profit potential as well. If it's not there, then I just won't take the trade. But it's, it varies depending on the security and the average to range and how much it moves. Okay, love it. Yeah, and that's the same for me. I, I use more of a of a candle. Um, like, for example, I'll give these guys a picture. So, for example, if I'm looking at, you know, this oil trade from this morning, um, this is on the actual micro. I'm going to leave it on the micro for now. But here's the, oh, uh, let's see here. Let me just find where that was. Um I had the fibs all set up for us and I think I moved them here, but uh, yeah, 10 five. So let me just grab this here. Um, yeah, here it is. So here's the, uh, it's got the little dot under there. I can put an arrow, but let me just refib this so people can see it. But what I've got here is the, so this is the, this is the origin. I call this the origin of the move. So this is where, you know, things went positive with regard to RSI and stochastic. This is a point that, you know, I, I would consider, you know, becoming a participant. Um, so what I do is I look at the range of the candle. I'm going to look at the high and the low. And in this example, we are at, uh, let's see, what is that? 21, 
31, about 37 cents. Okay. So on one contract of the mini, that would be $370, $37 roughly on a micro. So um, what I've done here, and let me share this with you. This is pretty cool. Uh, actually, a student did this for me. I've got, a, again, just a really great group of students that are in my room, you know, almost every day. Um, and he actually came up with this. I, I, I asked him to work with it. And mm -hmm. um, so this is a position size. It's future specific, okay. but it's a position size calculator. So basically what it does, it's got our five, you know, products here and you could do this on the minis or the micros. I just happen to have the micros up, but um, you know, it's got the spread. So in other words, what is this, you know, what is that difference between that high and that low? If you're using that as your, as your risk, um, and then it tells you based on, and again, you could change all of this, but here's, you know, 150 bucks at risk. So if you don't want to risk any more than $150 on one trade, this actually gives you, and again, this is just an example. You guys can modify this however you want, but, um, it tells you how many contracts you can be trading and then it gives, you know, and then you can do some really flexible things with regard to, you know, scaling out. So let me do this live. So if I go here, I'm, I'm going to change this 30. I'm going to put 37 because it's 37 ticks on the spread there. And I'm going to hit enter. And now you'll see it's telling me right here. If I, I can, I can do 3.8 contracts and it will be under the 150. Okay. So it tells me, and again, I call it a position, it's future specific position size calculator. I've seen these for stocks. Mm -hmm. I've never really seen one for, for futures like this, and it's pretty cool. So there's my risk. It shows me exactly how many contracts I can trade while keeping the risk under 150. So now I can simply go to my chart and the way I have these fibbed off. So now I have some flexibility. Oh, I'm going to share this with you guys. Now I can have some flexibility with regard to you know, how do I want to scale out? You know, do I want to scale out at one to one? You know, and if I did that, I would still have two contracts available. I mean, obviously for me, I, I teach the odd numbers. I love the odd numbers because if I hit one to one and I, if I can achieve one to one and scale out of two, now mathematically, I've just locked in more profit than I can lose mathematically. So right. um, that's how, you know, that's one method for handling this. So use the position size calculator. It tells me three contracts. I could drop two over here. I could drop another one either at the three to one, two to one or three to one level. And, and I'm out. And what's cool about that is, you know, you and I, Merlin, and actually you're in, you're in that situation right now where you've got long trades and you're profitable, um, but it's not necessarily locked in. And you and I know, you know, exactly how that feels. And we also know that it can turn at any point, oh, yeah. you know, so we do as much as we can to keep it in our favor, but we both know that, you know, as I'm sitting up here with price at two to one, and I've got all this profit in this trade, we know this thing can turn at any point. So what we want to do is psychologically locking in at an early price point, again, whether it be one to one, or I teach another formula, another strategy that, that takes the ATR of the origin candle, which is also pretty high, really high probability and pretty cool. But now all of a sudden, if I've locked in two here, I don't really care. I can walk away. If this whole thing goes against me, I still mathematically have have a winning trade. And if it goes to my two to one, three to one, even better. Right. You know, so it gives you a little bit of peace of mind or confidence to stay in and actually be a participant in some of those much bigger moves, which, you know, ultimately is what can really do some nice things, you know, for your trading. Um, so again, it's this thing here. Like I said, I call it a it's a future specific um position size calculator, and it's uh it's pretty customizable. But uh I wanted to show this to you because I've never shown this to you, I've never shown this to your students. Um, this just went out to some of my students who went through my third course. I threw this in as kind of a, a bonus piece to you. And I got a little surprise for your viewers uh, before we go today. But okay. uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show this to you. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, this is what helped me early on learn futures as well because each contract is, is – can be rather difficult in knowing what it is per tick and and they're all going to be different depending which futures product it is so if you are trading specific ones and you should make out a spreadsheet like this which is saying okay here's how many i uh what the futures contract is here's what it is per tick how many can i trade and get my risk management there so we can get a sense as to overall risk management so yeah i love it i think especially for people starting off with futures it's good because it'll make you go to the specifications site of the CME or whatever exchange you're traded on, find all those details out so you are familiar with that product and then put it in this spreadsheet. So it's never a guessing game like, oh, well, shoot, if it moves 10 points, how much do I make or lose? Well, now you'll know. Just plug it in there. You should know very, very quickly. And as uh, Pepe says here, after doing this for eight years, I, I know my levels. I know what I'm in. But uh, yeah, the newbies probably don't have that that ability. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, someone like you and I, yeah, we could do this in our heads, but 
you know, as people, I mean, that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the most common questions I used to get traveling on the road doing the futures classes was, you know, what is the value of this contract? What's the value yeah. of that contract? And because you're right, people who are just getting started, they don't know that. So it really, uh, yeah, it's a helpful little tool. It's a nice little resource. And, uh, you know, it works out pretty cool. I'd add one thing for anybody who's creating something like this. Um, most of the indexes are going to have the same trading hours. However, you start to get into some of these commodities they're gonna have different hours. And I would just put a little note like trading hours so you don't get caught all of a sudden holding something or, or making a trade in something in a very illiquid period of time. Uh, that that also be one little, just an extra piece I would add to this. Absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, no, knowing the highest volume times of the market is a is a huge thing. So uh, yeah, I absolutely agree on that, Merlin. That's awesome. Uh, Tom asked you a good question here and, and it's an interesting one. Tom says, uh, after a big S&P move like today, what are your thoughts on the reactions to other scheduled news like the FOMC this week? Do you see big moves or was that the big move for the week? So for example, you know, we had the CPI number coming out today. Everybody knew what was going to happen. Anticipation was it was going to be better. And I think the charts showed that starting Sunday night. But tomorrow we've got FOMC. Thursday we have three central banks. I believe Bank of Canada. I believe we have the Bank of England. And I believe we have the ECB. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it's those three all coming out with a rate statement on Thursday. That's huge. Plus, we have announcements on Friday. You know, do you look at that type of stuff when mapping out your trades? Hey, this could be a major, we may be reacting more towards this piece of news or that, or are you just, just straight charts? No, I am aware of when those are. The big thing for me, and, and you, you alluded to it earlier, um, with regard to uh, your trading plan and your trading hours. So I only trade, for the most part, um, I only trade the day session, so somewhere between you know Pacific time, what six thirty and one fifteen, I will occasionally do things in the evening, um, but I'm not normally trading early market before the market opens. Um, so I'm not a, I'm not a part of some of these announcements that happen pre market. The only big one that I mention to people and that I'm aware of, like for example tomorrow, is an FOMC announcement or an FOMC meeting. Um, and those are I'm trying to think of the time zone. Was it 11:15? I think you yep. guys Pacific time. Yep. They should announce something tomorrow. And obviously that's during market hours. So I always just tell people, you know, unless you're doing some type of an options play where you're looking for volatility and you're looking for a move, I normally am um, flat. I'm not. I don't, I'm not normally having a position. At least certainly not a short term position. Open as that announcement's coming, because more often than not, it will stop you out and either go against you or go in the direction that you originally expected, but I won't hold anything going into it. But that's really the only one that I pay close attention to are the FOMC stuff, because everything else for the most part is going to be a pre-market announcement and I'm not going to trade pre-market right. for the most part. So okay. um, that's how I handle those. Makes sense. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm a little different there. So for example, tomorrow is a major announcement and to Tom, so I can get, to answer your question succinctly, um, basically, when I look at this price chart, and I'll bring it up here on the screen for everybody that we've, we've been looking at with this S&P, really since we opened up on Sunday night, it's been just a, a beautiful, slow building uptrend leading into that CPI announcement. So my gut tells me that there was some leaked information here and people kind of knew what was going to be happening. Well, this is a five. Um, happening with regards to that CPI number. And given what happened on Friday, it should have been somewhat expected that CPI would have been better than anticipated. However, we get to that big announcement, it surges up here, and of course, that initial spike that you see right here, that's everybody and their mother going, oh my God, inflation is over, this is it, we're gonna get back to 99 cent per gallon oil and I can go buy a dozen eggs for 32 cents. No, still 7.1% inflation, people. We're not out of the woods yet. The good news is, and I think the reality was, okay, we're not out of the woods. As you can see, the market came back down, but it still held some gains. And, and the belief here is that we're going to hear some positive news tomorrow. We'll get 50 basis points. For those who don't know why we'll get 50 basis point increase, it's because the probability right now is a 79.4% chance. We're going to have a um, rate increase tomorrow of only 50 basis points, not 75. Now, when you couple that with the uh, press conference is going to happen shortly after that. The belief is that the two most recent, actually three, core PCE price index, PPI, and CPI numbers have all showed a contraction in inflation that Jerome Powell's tone may soften just a little bit, right? And really maybe start to be a little bit more optimistic. Plus, we still have oil in, in a pretty big sell-off. So I think the expectation is that there's going to be more upside this week based off what Jerome Powell's doing. So Tom, I do look at this announcement. I think this foreshadowing personally more upside. That's why I, I could have closed out my position today. I did not. I do uh, plan on being up earlier tomorrow and I'm putting orders to sell my long positions way out of the money. I mean, way out of the money. 
And the reason for that is I do expect there to be huge spikes when Jerome Powell speaks. And if I can catch one of those fools that's doing a market buy uh, on some giant spike, great. I'll be happy to, to lock in some profits. But I'm, I'm selling my positions way out of the money. And if it goes the opposite direction, we have a huge crash tomorrow. If there's major volatility, I will look to sell uh, some puts and get a lot of premium for my money way out of the money. So anyway, just uh, a little insight into what my strategy might be for tomorrow. But I am into using uh, today's news as a catalyst for further upside for the rest of the week. <clears throat> Maybe not the rest of the week, yeah, but certainly through uh, Wednesday. Yeah, I love the different approaches, Merle. That's, that's what I always tell my my viewers that that's so cool. I mean, because you know, you got a great perspective on what you're looking at and it's 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 unique as is mine. So it's, it's for them to get, you know, both of our inputs is it's it's why you have the following you have and and, and myself as well. So it's it's a lot of fun and I love it. It makes a ton of sense. Oh, and you and I both are in the same camp, which is we don't really care if we're wrong. I mean, I, I look, I don't want to be wrong, but I don't really particularly care. It's not like, oh, God, end of the world. I'm an idiot. Hey, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I just close out and move on to something else. But uh, yeah, that's that's absolutely. Yeah. Assessing risk is the first thing you do. So, you know, we know ahead of time we're not going to be right on everything. We just want to be right as often as possible. And, you know, if we're not right, then we know exactly, uh, you know, what how how not right we're going to be. So and we're able to <laughs> we're able to identify that and and customize that, which is huge. Uh, let's see. I will um, <clears throat> go over to your website here. Talk us a little bit. So you you mentioned you've got some classes coming up here, and you also have uh, an indicator for these guys or something like that. Yeah, you know, everyone, um, is there a way for me to see your screen, like what you're showing? Uh, no, you can just tell me, and I'll draw it over there. Okay. No, you're cool. If you're, if you're on the Pacific Shore site. Yep. Um, yeah, what I always encourage people to do is go to my testimonials, please. You know, I've, I've got, like I said, a number of students that are, have been really good to me over the over the time I've been there. Um, please read over the testimonials and, uh, yeah, I've been doing your show a long time. We've, we've got a lot of history. You and me, I want to, I want to give a gift to people who might be serious about going to another level with their trading. And, um, so what I'm going to do, um, for a limited time with, with, for your viewers and, and they can email me on this, my email is at the bottom of the first page at Pacific shores, but, um, I have a day trading room that I host Monday through Friday for the most part. Um, it's, you know, we go between an hour and two hours each morning, uh, all of the sessions are recorded. Uh, I offer that for like uh, 69 a month, I think it is, 69.95 a month, which is an introductory price that I have kept since I opened this just a few months ago. Uh, I'm going to be increasing that for new members, you know, in January. But for your group and, and for people who want to come into my room and see what we do, and if you're not able to be there live, you can catch a recording. You know, you get uh, an hour or two of, of, of live, you know, market analysis every day. Um if you if one were to sign up, if they decide that they want to sign up for that room, you know, starting this week, uh, I'm going to throw in um, two, two, uh, one of two things. OK, and then they can designate to me which one they want. And I've never done this before. But again, your your group is special. You and I have been doing this a long time. So, um, you know, what, Merlin, actually, that's fine. So I have uh, one of the custom indicators, the little dots that, you know, blends the two indicators together. Um, I will give them that indicator upon signing up for their first month in the room. And if they would rather not use that and they would rather have the position size calculator, I will send them that. So either or, it's one or the other. But um, again, it's a gift and, and it's, the, it's the Christmas season. So I'm going to leave that rate at $69.95 for the month. Uh, it's month to month. So there's no contractual obligation there. But if they want to come in, I'm going to throw a little bonus on top for them. And like I said, that indicator. Merlin, let me share my chart for just a second if I could. Sure. Sure, Santa like Baldwin. Said, this is something I, oh, I'm party. I said, sure, Santa Baldwin. <laughs> um, I'm trying to find an example here where, like I said, I, I looked at indicators for a long time. I know we all have, and um, so this one I actually custom did, and like I said, I, I it, it's it's pretty cool. Now, like I said, it, it requires understanding how to use it, and that's why I'm, you know, particular about who I give it to. I don't just give it out, and I don't just sell it outright. So, um. And actually, I'm getting I'm on a Wi-Fi feed at the hotel here, so I'm getting a little bit of a freeze. So um, here, what I will do is just show an example of, you know, what this looks like. So here's, uh, yeah, you guys should be able to yeah, we see got my chart. You got it? Yep. Okay, so so like, if, for example, this is a bearish signal, this little, this, this little pink dot up here, okay? This little pink dot, this little pink dot this little pink dot this shows where the market and you can see the follow through here it shows you where the market has gone bearish and, and quite honestly you see the follow through and that's what i'm looking for if i'm going to get short somewhere here i want to see follow through and that's what i'm getting okay 
And then obviously, you know, on the flip side of that, I've got the little blue indicator. And that's what um, that's what I used yesterday on that 1005 candle on the S&P um, that actually, you know, shows you where there's up moves. Yeah, here. So here's one here. Here's one here. It, it comes in on all the time frames, by the way. So I use the dot on the larger time frames to establish an established trend. And then I go to the smaller time frame, just match the dots. And all of a sudden, there's follow through, there's follow through, there's follow through. I mean, it's, you know, nothing is 100% of the time. And this is not 100%. But I'll tell you what, I put it up against any indicator I've seen out there. And and I've seen a lot. I, I've checked out a lot of, a lot of it's, different it's indicators. It's a crush. So anyway, if they sign up for the room, I'll give them this. If they sign up for the room, they'd rather they'd rather have the probability calculator. I'll give them that. But come on into the room, read the testimonial, see what we do. If you like it, you stick around. And if you don't, if it's not for you, then it's not for you. But uh, I wanted to at least make them that offer. Uh, and thanks for letting me do that, Merlin. No problem. Hey, uh, thanks for doing it. And by the way, just so you know, 8% of the world is colorblind. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, you got all kinds of pinks there. I can't see no pink. Right. You're like pink dot. Right. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. <laughs> the little dot's either below the candle or it's above. So if it's below, it's bullish. If it's above, it's bearish. Uh, okay. I thought you had all kinds of different colors on here. I'm like, man, I didn't see nothing. Oh, red, green, pink, it's... whatever. It's simple. <laughs> By the way, here's here's the uh, – don't answer this one right away, Jerry. This is just kind of a fun one for the viewers out there. Um, for everyone that's watching, type in what you think the answer is to this one. What color is the black box on an airplane? So when an airplane, you know, it's got a recording box and it's called the black box. What color is it? <clears throat> kind of a fun little one. Do you know what it is, Jerry? What would your guess be? I would just guess the obvious that it is actually black. Survey would say you were incorrect, sir. All right. Uh, incorrect? You are incorrect. Not correct. Okay. It's, it's not a black box. It's actually, believe it or not, it's orange, which is a strange one. Yeah, Vernon. Vernon, you see, these, we got some smart smart cookies. They all got it right. Everybody knew it was orange. Somebody why Googled you, why it. Why do you know that, Merlin? Why do you know that? <laughs> oh, I'm a, I'm a master of just weird, weird trivia. Just bizarre. Uh, yeah, I know so many weird little trivia facts. Here's another one. Um, Nah, okay, I'll, I'll tell it to you guys. Um, the all-time scoring leader in the NBA is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He's got like 38,000 points or something, like miles in front of any other player in the NBA. How many three-pointers in, in, in his 21 seasons did Kareem Abdul-Jabbar make? Remember, three-pointers, right? Remember, and just to give a reference, in one season, Steph Curry hit 408 in one season. I think it's 408. How many did Kareem Abdul-Jabbar hit in his entire career? Anybody know that one? I'm going to give it a second, but I think I know that one. You do? Okay. You, we've given it a second. We've given enough time for people to type in the chat. What do you think it is? Zero. One. He's one of the greatest shooters in the history of mankind, and he's only hit one three-pointer. It is absolutely hysterical. Like, I may have... Scored one three pointer in an NBA game. Jeez, Louise, come on, buddy, pull your act together. <laughs> Do I get something for being really close, though? I mean, I and you know, you know why that is, right? Yeah, because he's always in the paint. He's seven something. He's always right there. The other side of that, Merle, is that rule didn't come in. They didn't start the three point shot till after his career, late in his career. Oh, okay. There was no three point line before that. Really? I, I got. I got to look that, at that one. That's, I, I, <clears throat> I double check it, but that's that's why I was guessing it was a trick question. The answer was zero because Kareem played in the what 60s, Oops. 70s, early 80s, and, and we'd have to we would have to Google when the origin of the three point line came into the NBA. But it was way after. I believe it was way after his career. Oops. I know sports like crazy. I'm not a huge basketball, but I know sports, and I, I believe that's right. I'll be really curious. I'll probably end up googling that myself. I will right after the show because I'm just curious when they implemented the three point shot because that's such a key point of. Uh, of, uh, of of basketball, man. Look at Steph Curry. Anyway, we could go on and on. Let's do a sports show one of these days. How about that? Oh, I would love that, bro. That's that I would love. That I would love. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank Here's you. You're the best, man. Hey, I appreciate you coming on, Jerry. Thanks for sharing some uh, insights in this market, a little bit of active futures trading, and uh, sharing some indicator stuff. We appreciate it. Uh, all the best to you for the rest of the week, my friend. I'll probably see you. Uh, probably see you in the new year. So happy. Have a fantastic holiday and a good new year. All right, Merlin. You too. Thanks again for everything. Have a great one. I'll see you soon. I right, take care. Bye. All right. Bye. -bye. Yeah, that was Jerry Baldwin of Pacific Shores Trading. You can go to the website out there. I posted that one. I uh, actually didn't post it, but you can see the link right here. And that's PacificShoresTrading.com. There you go. <clears throat> um, you're lying on his Skyhook, which is the best. Yeah, exactly, Tom. I thought the same thing. Like, he, Kareem, 
Jabbar's arms were so long, like he could sit under the basket, it would be considered a three-pointer when we did the skyhook, right? Just nuts. Um, Adam, you said, uh, do you guys do trade analysis? Yes. So, you know, I, I'm I'm not a financial advisor, or so I can't give quote-unquote financial advice, but we love looking at trades. So if there's anything that you ever get a chance, you go, hey, could you check this thing out? Look at this stock, or look at this... Oh, we're always happy to do it. And plus, we've got a whole bunch of people in here who actually are active traders as well, and, and they may give you some feedback in here. So I love it. Big Eb is loving our $4 gas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty. The electric, you want an electric bike, Big Eb? That's all about that electric bike now. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let me go into, I had one, um, a couple different questions I want to make sure I get to. Uh, I'm just going to do this one question because i got to wrap things up here. But Tom, since he's here, he's usually here. Tom sent this one in and said, I, I assume reverse splits have some characteristics like they move up for a bit and right after, uh, but they continue down after the split, right? Maybe I'll do a short play after the split. Um, I'm going to say I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with those. I don't, um, I don't, if something's in a downtrend so aggressively, like Carvana, right? We talk about car, um, let's see, CV and A. So here's Carvana. If you look at something that's this appallingly bad as a price chart, down another 2% today and down 1.6 in after hours, you know, they're going to do a reverse split. And then I, I said within 120 days from this line right here, uh, they're going to do a reverse split, most likely, or they'll be delisted. I personally have only seen them continue down. I don't really remember seeing any of them have a big pop up. Like when somebody says they're doing a normal split like Tesla did, we generally will see a, a nice run up and it looks great. Uh, and then they, they they rally all the way through the split date. And then when the split finally happens, they sell off. I mean, you just look here at Tesla. So here's Tesla's chart. We can, um, <clears throat> there's the split date, but one of the announcements, ooh, that's not actually a good example of it. Um, the other one, this is a better one. But back here, you can see where they split on August 20th of 2020. Well, this is the date they made the announcement was um, August 11th. And it just screamed up. I mean, it did nothing but go up. And then they made the split and it sells off. I don't see that happening the other way um, with reverse splits. It's a crap company. If it's if it's needing a reverse split, it's garbage. Um, God, there's a couple. Heliomathis, New York. Uh, HMNY. Uh, he, yeah, this is another one, Heliomathis. I mean, this company here, I'll put this on a weekly just so you guys can see it. This is the one that did Movie Pass, right? And if you look at it, it looks like this price is up here at $35,000 a share. Well, it, it wasn't up there. They've just done so many reverse splits. I'll scroll back here. I mean, this company's dead. Back here, they did a 250 to 1 reverse split. And then they did before that something even bigger. I think it was like a 500 to 1 reverse split way back here. Um, but I don't see it running up into it. I, I don't. It seems like it just barely moves. There's a 4 for 1 reverse split. So unfortunately, Tom, <coughs> I don't know the answer to that. I, I know on normal splits that there's usually a big run up into the split date. But I, do I really... From all you know about me, Tom, do you think I'm really trading something that's just in a colossal downtrend under 5 bucks? I don't care. I, I leave it alone personally. So I don't have the, the personal experience to give you the answer on that one. Sorry. Um, you just reminded me of my old friend, FNGU. Yep. Yeah. So that's different, right? There you're looking at an ETF, a basket of uh, securities. That's a little bit different in my book. So um, individual securities tend to have these characteristics, but not typically with um, something like FNGU or FNGD or FAS, FAX, that type of stuff. Okay, um, I'm going to just show you the economic counter for tomorrow because i got to get out of here. Uh, right now, as you guys have seen on my charts over here, you have a 50 basis point increase coming tomorrow. That's right around an 80% chance. Kind of surprised we didn't see this uh, get higher. I thought that you'd see maybe, just maybe, the, a third column over here. And this whole thing shifting over to the right, meaning the 75 basis point chance getting lower. I was going to say maybe getting down to like 5%. Maybe the... Um, 50 basis point increase getting to about 80, and then maybe uh, you know a 15% chance of a 25 point. Now I don't think they'll do 25. I think that they need to keep uh, their pedal to the metal. You know we still are at a pretty good inflation clip, even with that good CPI number. You know part of this, <clears throat> I think a large part of it has to do with what's been going on with a lot of these prices here. You know here is the price of crude oil. The crude oil has been just getting butchered. We were up at 130 bucks um, back in 20 
early 2022 and you know we're almost 50 percent we're almost half of the price of oil that certainly is going to have a good impact on inflation data and we've been aggressively selling off now i um i am long crude oil right now and well, actually i'm not long crude oil futures i am with uso and i'm also long on xle so i've got a bunch of xle call options as well as some financials but um, you know, my, my assumption would be this this will probably rally back up and may test that $80 level. If it does, I'll probably unload my my uh, call options, which I have for March. Now, all in all, if this keeps dropping, inflation is going to start to look better and better and better. And this will probably be part of Jerome Powell's talk track at the press conference tomorrow will be talking about inflation, talking about crude oil and how commodity prices have softened quite a bit. And that's helping. But again, we're not out of the woods yet. <clears throat> all right. Let's see. Merlin. We'll, we'll be in line for a Neuralink. Uh, he'll be able to get Twitter straight to your brain. Uh, no, I, I am. I, I don't even want a tattoo. Um, someone asked me, said, would you ever get a tattoo? And I said, would you put a bumper sticker on a Bentley? No, um, no, I would not be getting a Neuralink. I don't see the need for it. I'd rather have a handheld device I can put down and walk away from having a chip in my brain uh, that, I, that I'm stuck with. Mm -mm, no, nah, not going to happen. Not for me. It's like your upper rule, don't uh, do a type of rule. Yeah, and I think, Pepe, we all should have those, those rules. You should have, if there's something in the markets that's burned you so badly that it's just, you can't stop thinking about it, then you have to just disconnect yourself from that trade, that security, that commodity, whatever it is, altogether and just leave it alone. Now, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to get Bill Addis on the show, and if I can get him on this week, I will. Tomorrow, I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into what's happened with Sam Bankman-Fried. You guys may have heard about Sam Bankman-Fried being arrested in the Bahamas. If you thought this story couldn't get any weirder, it's getting weirder. Um, there is some crazy thing. The, the fact that he was arrested yesterday and not tonight after the congressional testimony that went on where he was supposed to be and could have incriminated himself with a whole bunch of information, but the Justice Department said, no, we're going to issue an arrest warrant to happen before the congressional testimony is jaw-dropping and reeks of conspiracy theories. Anyway, I'll talk about Sam bankman free tomorrow um, and what's been going on with Binance for anybody who is in the crypto space. Um, you might want to be biting your fingernails right now because if, if the trend continues with Binance right now, Crypto could have a apocalyptic type of day or week. Um, but again, I don't mean to be fear-mongering, but a lot of money has been pouring off of the Binance exchange. So we'll see if they are, in fact, solvent. But that's uh, see what happens over the next couple of days. <clears throat> yeah. And maybe it did save him from taking the fifth. If you watch the congressional testimony today, uh, yeah, I watched it live today. It was awesome. It was even the new CEO, you know, he came, he's appointed uh, to go through and, and weed out all the mess. Even he was like, this is... This is crazy. This company, they were doing with QuickBooks. There's a $40 billion company doing QuickBooks, you know, and, and, and messaging back and forth money, like not even really knowing. And conveniently enough, Sam Bankman-Fried's parents, oh, wow, a bunch of uh, money flowing out to his parents, who I guess were part of his legal counsel as well. So there we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I still think $10,000 is in play. Yes, Tom, I agree. Somebody should put a camera in Sam Bankman-Fried's cell to make sure it is on. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, who was the guy that had the island with all the pedophiles? Um, um, oh my God, I can't even think of the guy's name. There was a, a funny meme going, "Oh yeah, Sam, don't worry, you'll be you'll be fine in prison because uh, there's plenty of cameras there." And uh, it's the guy who died in prison. Uh, I can't remember his name. I'm trying to forget those crazy people. All right, let me show you what's happening for tomorrow. And there's really not a lot on the our earnings front. You have Lennar Brothers tomorrow, which I think is important, but it's all about this calendar right here. Look at the top. You've got import prices. Starts off slow. That's an hour before markets open. At 11 a.m., that is your FOMC statement. Right now, 50 basis points is the expectation. That will probably happen. But really, the action will probably start. Oh, there you go. Jeffrey Epstein. Thank you. I, for some reason, I just drew a blank right there. Yeah, it's hard to... You try to forget about... People who are absolute scumbags, which is shocking. I still remember Sam Seiden. But anyway, um, 11.30 will be that press conference, and that, to me, is worth watching. I like sitting there and listening to the whole thing. Even though it's boring to some, this is going to steer the course of our economy going forward. So I like to listen to it live and to see what happens with the markets. After that, nothing else for the U.S. You do have some um, WPI numbers coming out for Germany later after our show tomorrow, but that is pretty much it. All right, uh, that's going to do it.
I'm going to wrap things up here. Hope you enjoyed today's show. I hope you learned a little bit something there from Jerry Baldwin of Pacific Shores Trading. You can always visit his website. He said if you sign up for his thing, he'll even give you a, a, one of his free indicators. So cool. There you go. A little value added for you. Um, not exactly sure 100% what the schedule will look like the rest of the week with regards to guests, but I am going to try to bring Bill Addis on. Hopefully uh, tomorrow, if I can get him tomorrow, it would be awesome. Actually, let me real quickly check and see. Sometimes he sneaks in a message while I'm doing a show or something, and uh, I might be able to confirm if he's going to be on or not. So give me two seconds here as I just check. Um, and I didn't watch the documentary. I kind of wanted to watch the documentary on Giselle Maxwell, get, get whatever name is, uh, but uh, I just haven't done it. So he hasn't responded back to me yet, so I'm not sure, but most likely he'll be on this week, which would be great because there's some. we had a horrible horrible 10-year bond auction. Let me build out. We'll shed some more light on that. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you have questions, put them down below. Any of the YouTube videos, I will put them on the list for tomorrow to go over when we talk about SP, uh, Sam Bankman fried and FTX a little bit more. And of course, if you have anything else you want to discuss, email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Until then, happy trading. I will see you all tomorrow. Take care.